thank you, Rekindle, for preparing our hearts for receiving God's word. Um, I consider it a great honor to be asked to speak in chapel. Thank you, Dr. White, for the invitation. But to be very honest, I had to chuckle when I looked at the date, and I knew that it was the last message of the semester because I knew what I would be facing. Um, that is, those of you here who were able to wake up to your alarm this morning, while many of your roommates and friends slept through them, the uh, glazed look in the eyes, um, many of you having had an all-nighter or another late night working on that final paper, that final project, or running out with friends for half-price apps taking a break. Mine just a little bit foggy, struggling to remember what day it is. I'm wishing you could remember your roommate's name. <laughs> I know this because I've been there and I've seen it for a really long time now. Between elementary, high school, college, graduate school, doctoral programs, I've spent about 25 years in school as a student. And now I'm observing my 23rd year as a professor here. I've had three kids and two daughter-in-laws all graduate from here. And I've seen the cycle, and it's very predictable. The excitement of getting started, and then two to three weeks in realizing it's not camp and there's some work to do. Uh, the pressures of midterms, the crashes around fall and Thanksgiving break, returning for the home stretch, just trying to stay focused, trying to stay healthy, trying to just care enough to finish well, well, really, all you want to do is spend more time with your friends. But it's not just an issue of the university. This is a universal problem you're going to find in all of life. Let me just ask some questions for us to consider. Have you ever described yourself as being burnt out? Do you ever begin the week exhausted or more tired than when you ended the week? Do you ever feel like life is out of control? Do you ever feel like your schedule is controlled by school or work or others? Do you find it hard to keep focused on living for Christ in the midst of the daily and the weekly routine, whether that's school or work, or play, friends, family? Are there times when your spiritual life just feels dry and empty, even when there's nothing apparently wrong? I've never asked these questions and had a group or a class say, oh, that's not me. Usually there's embarrassed laughter, a sigh, but it's a recognized challenge for all of us, and it's really prevalent here in the university years, but it doesn't end here. I hear the same issue from all ages and all stages of life. Consider just a few things about these areas. First, life consumes resources, just the stuff of life. Work, classes, um, jobs, people, service, hobbies, that stuff of life takes energy, physical, emotional, um, spiritual, it, it, mental energy, and it takes that from us on a daily basis. These different areas are all interrelated. And what I mean by that is if you run yourself to exhaustion in one area, it affects the others. If you run yourself to exhaustion physically, it will affect you emotionally, and it will affect you spiritually. If you allow yourself to run dry spiritually, it will have an emotional impact and it will affect you physically. They're all interrelated. You're a complete person. You don't instantaneously go from full to empty. There's a pattern of life of being recharged and energized and then using those resources and then recharged and energized and re almost like filling the gas tank in the car and then driving the car and using the fuel. But running on empty indicates real imminent danger. And this is the point we miss where um, one of my kids just this last week mentioned around Cedarville, it's almost like being exhausted or burnt out is worn like a badge of honor. And I interact with a lot of people in ministry where they talk about how exhausted and burnt out they are on the edge and they treat it like it's something holy instead of the dangerous zone that it is. Consider some of the dangers. Physically, more at risk for a car accident. Injuries when you're playing sports sicknesses that you just can't get over. The headaches, the backaches, the insomnia. Consider the risk mentally when you just can't concentrate. You know what it's like when the beginning of the semester you had a chapter to read and it takes you about 20 to 30 minutes to read it and do the journal or whatever you need to do for it, and now you stare at that same page over and over and over, and after two hours you close the book and your roommate says, what did you just read? And you can't remember what book it was. Emotionally, you find yourself getting upset over tiny things. 
just can't let go of issues that you know you should and it feels like an out-of-body experience while you're seeing yourself getting upset and breaking into tears over tiny little things, the drama gear kicks into high and for many stays into overdrive. Relationally, you're likely here to say things that you may regret for the rest of your life. You may damage a relationship that can never be repaired. You become insensitive to other people's needs. You're sitting across the table from someone hurting and desperately needing help, and inside you're thinking, I just don't care. I know I should, but I don't. At these points, you're vulnerable to temptation. You are more vulnerable to give in to sin. But God didn't design us to run that way. God didn't design us to run on empty. But God has composed a rhythm for life, a cadence for life that can help us keep him at the center where he belongs and can guard us from the danger of turning other things that are good into our God. It's a rhythm composed at creation that can still guide us to help us keep him central in our lives while others, all these other voices are calling for our attention and our energy. And so today what I want to do in just these few minutes is look at that cadence or that rhythm and the three different aspects that we have and just we're going to look briefly at each, give an example of each, and then try to make some suggestions about what we might do to work on it. So it's really more an overview of a perspective on time and God's rhythm for life. So with this, we're going to consider first the daily rhythm. And we move back to the creation account when we see this poetic structure repeated six times. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And repeatedly after each of those, it was good. It was good. It was good until the sixth day when it's declared to be very good. Consider this pattern. From the dawn of creation, there was a daily rhythm of work and rest. Of work and rest. Now, I do need to at least comment. I, I do think we have this kind of backwards because we tend to think of the day and then going to bed at night where the creation account starts with the evening and then looks at the day following. Now that might not seem significant, but think about what it's like to get up in the morning, scrambling to get to your class, working to get things done, struggling to get focused, pushing hard through the day till you fall into bed in exhaustion at night to catch up which is a very different perspective than starting the night saying, God, I trust you to give me the rest and the refreshment I need tonight to have energy for tomorrow, and waking up saying, God, now I have the energy to serve you in this day, and then finishing that day with the satisfied fatigue of having lived for him to go back into rest to prepare for the next day. This pattern of work and rest reminds us that work is good, and right now your classes, your studies, that's your work. Your work is good, but also the other jobs you have, and your relationships and your hobbies, all of the stuff of life, it's good. There's great fulfillment in doing those and living those in a way that honors God, the way he intended. But while work is good, work is not the highest good. While work is good, work is not the highest good. But those things of life always call for me to give them more attention and more time and more energy they call out saying, give to me, and those calls never end. And those calls are usually urgent, saying, this paper's due tomorrow. This person's knocking on your door or texting you. They're urgent, and they always want more. They're never satisfied. And the risk is then that as we listen to those voices and respond to those over time, they become our God. They get the inordinate attention and energy. In doing so, they take a place they were never intended to have. Listen, Understand that daily this is a challenge for us, right? It's why even through the day we're encouraged to spend time in God's word and time in prayer to remind us of the place he should have in our lives and remind us how to live for him. It's why on this campus we have a chapel where as an educational institution we say classes get set aside and this becomes a priority because it reminds us to keep this perspective that while work is good, work is not the highest good. It confesses that there's something more important. Now, if you will, to think about this, in many ways, your light switch is an altar on which you worship something. Uh, the lights you know, are lights and electricity for this. It's, it's the technological advance that has a spiritual 
um, temptation that most of us tend to miss. That light switch tends to delude us to believe that we can control time, that we can manage light and darkness. But there's 24 hours in a day and a rhythm that God has established all the same. And we worship at that altar. We worship something when we leave it on and do other things, another Netflix movie, more time with friends. We've spent all day doing that and now we have to crank the paper out late at night. We've worshiped other things without following the pattern God has for work and for rest. Let me just encourage you as you think about this, that when you turn on or off that light switch, you're confessing your belief in three different areas. You are making a confession of what you believe about God and about yourself and about the world. So, so let me just, as simply as I can, just suggest what this might look like. As you begin the day, and, and if this would help you, I would just suggest, take an index card and just write, God is, I am, and the world will, and tape it on your light switch. So when you get up in the morning and you wake up with energy from your rest, you turn on the light and you say, what? God is what's most important today. He allowed me to rest and gave me now the platform to serve him and he needs to be central. And I'm here to serve him. He's given me the minds to think, the opportunity to study, the platform to serve, the relationships to engage. Those are gifts from him and I'm here to serve him. And the world will be a better place if I do that. When I keep growing, when I honor him, when I influence other people, when I advance his kingdom, I am promoting his cause and his work. And you turn that light on, and then as you serve him through the day, you know what happens. The stuff of life calls for its attention and screams at you to take over. And so what do you do? You take time to honor him in the word. You take time to pray. You engage people meaningfully. You take time for chapel. You do those things to keep pushing, to keep God at the center while other voices want to take control. But then at night... When that day is done with this satisfying fatigue from a full God-centered day, you're confessing three things when you turn off the light and sleep. One, God is God. He never sleeps. He's gonna keep working even while I rest and I can trust him. God is God. But you're also confessing that I am not God. I'm human. I need rest. God graciously allows me the opportunity to rest and to be recharged and re-energized and to protect me from these dangers of running on empty. And we confess that the world will survive without me. The world's gonna keep going. Um, ever considered that those of us who tend to not sleep and run to exhaustion are really demonstrating a messianic complex? That the world can't get along without me and what I'm doing? Just encourage you, take an index card Put these three phrases, God is, I am, and the world will, and post it on your light switch. To wake up in the morning praying those confessions and then to go to bed at night saying, God's God, and I'm not God, I'm human, and I will rest, and the world will continue without me, but I can wake up in the morning and enter into God's song again. This is repeated through the week, work, rest, work, rest, and it continues on with verse after verse after verse until we reach the chorus on the weekend as we move into the second aspect of the rhythm, and that's the weekly rhythm. Consider this, and just listen to the account again from Genesis. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Notice again this pattern of creation, of work and then rest, it was a daily routine, but it was also weekly. And notice the poetic shift. While the evening and the morning being the first day and the second day was repeated once. Each time it was the day, first day, second day. But now when we reach the seventh, seventh is repeated three times. An emphasis being made here for the unique quality of this time. Notice this weekly rhythm that God had now finished his work and he rested. Okay, think about this. You think God needed a nap? It's not like he was worn out or tired saying, oh, big week, I need a break, right? God set a pattern for us of work and rest. And then he blessed the day. He sanctified it. He set it aside as being holy, holy, set apart for him. A Sabbath, this phrase, a Sabbath to the Lord. You hear what he's saying? You can talk about stewardship of money. We do that all the time, but we've got to talk about stewardship of time. And God says 14% of your time is mine. 
It's holy, set aside for a special purpose. And he created this pattern from creation, which means before there was sin, this is not the fatigue, it's not just the part of sin, but before there was sin in the world, Adam would work for six days in the garden. And can you picture a time anywhere in history where he would have more clearly seen fulfillment in his work and seen God in his work and honored God with his work, and yet even then, one day a week was set aside to rest and to refocus and honor God in a unique way. This clear reminder from the dawn of creation that work is good, but work is not the highest good. Work is good, but God must be kept in the center and kept in focus. Now, this weekly rhythm is explained a lot more, both in the reasons why and the patterns when we come to the Ten Commandments. Listen to Exodus chapter 20. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Notice two things about this. First, we are called to remember. Notice the positive orientation of this. This is only one of two of the Ten Commandments stated in this positive way. Um, It's a break away from the way we often have conversations about Sabbath that I think are really misplaced. Because in our circles, when I hear Sabbath come up, the first question is, well, what can I do? Is it okay to watch the Packers on the weekend? Can I play a soccer game? Do I have to do this? And we've missed the whole point. Here he says, this is time dedicated to the Lord that's holy to him, a tithe of time. And we are to remember creation, remember the place he has in our life. And in doing so, we're to rest. While we work six days, there's time to put that aside, to remind ourselves of something's more important, but to commune with God in a unique, in a special way. And these critical elements of remembering the day in a positive, holy way, but then also to rest is a significant part of what was intended for Sabbath. But notice also, this continues when the Ten Commandments are repeated in Deuteronomy, when we're told to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, remember you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Notice the reason here is different. Okay? In Exodus, it's the creation account and the order from creation. Now it's because they are redeemed people and he's saying, remember this pattern from redemption. That is... You were slaves, now you're free. You were slaves where you were controlled by your work. From sunrise to sunset, work dominated everything in your life, every day. And now you don't have that obligation anymore. So don't be stupid enough to make yourself a slave to your work again. And what he's calling us to do is to refocus to not allow work to take that dominating part of our lives, and I'm using work generically to speak of the stuff of life, work and relationships and the hobbies and all the things we do during the week. There's a place for them, and they're good, and they can honor God, but they can take over. And instead, he says, because of that, weekly, you take this time and you set it aside to commune with God in a unique way as holy time to keep him central where he should be in our lives. I need to make one comment. I think the clearest way to do this in in such a brief time, I wish we had more time, but I'm just going to give one illustration of the way a student practiced this here on campus for a while that I think was helpful. But I need to add one perspective again. Note that this Sabbath practice includes a night of rest. We misunderstand time when we think about days like silos and then the nights just get attached before or after. And so I watch students with their weekend experience up till all hours of the night, Saturday night, and exhausted as they approach church and then cramming to get stuff done again Sunday night, trying to see what they can fit in on Sunday. Instead of recognizing that this pattern for the Sabbath was evening and morning, that Jewish pattern started at six in the evening and went till six the next evening. It included a night of rest. So I had one student, and and I used to teach a wilderness ministry class, and we'd do backpacking trips in Colorado or in Canada, and we would always push for a few days really hard and feel the stress of being exhausted and then take a full day of Sabbath and solitude and kind of process that. I had a student who came back from that, and after thinking through those Sabbath issues, came back to campus and put this rhythm into play. 
On Saturday mornings, he wouldn't set an alarm. Okay, I'll let that sink in. Before I say that for him, that many woke up between 8.30 and 9. Okay, this wasn't a till noon or 1 o'clock thing. He'd get up between 8.30 and 9, and that morning time from 9 to noon was him and God. He might put on his hiking boots and go down to the gorge with his Bible and walk and pray and read. He might stay at home and shut everything off and just in his dorm room have time to read. It was kind of catch-up time with God, just him alone with God to read, to pray, to reflect on Scripture. And then about noon, he'd head over to the cafeteria and have a huge meal with his friends. And about one o'clock then, he found that he was at his, most, uh, his strongest, most energized point of the week. He'd had a good night's rest. He had just eaten, he had time with God. And so for him, from one till about seven o'clock on Saturday was his like kick it out study time. He'd hit the library every need. These are the big projects, the, the critical work that you have to dig into, the research, the writing, all those kind of things. And he would work like a dog, hard, focused. And then about seven o'clock, he'd put it aside. And let the Saturday evening be kind of quiet, and it might be different. He was often reading scripture for what was going to be in church the next morning. He was finishing up some ministry prep for that. It could be quiet time with friends, but the evening was relaxing and in many ways preparation for the next day of worship, and he'd make sure he was in bed by 11 or 12. He'd get up on Sunday morning, having had eight hours sleep, and he would go to church and participate in worship. He would be involved in ministry. He would serve. He would then come back and again have a big meal with friends. And then that afternoon from two till about six was really whatever he wanted to do. He might take a big nap. He might pull out the book he hasn't been able to read. He might go for a hike. He might have some conversations with friends or write some letters or emails to people that he needed to catch up with. It was just kind of quiet, relaxing time. And then about six o'clock, he would pull out his work for the week, but not the heavy duty stuff. He'd lay out his calendar for what was ahead and what assignments he was gonna have and lay out a schedule. He would take a couple of the smaller ones, like the reading assignments or a small writing project he could crank out in a half hour and he'd do a couple of those so he was ahead of the game and then he'd make sure he was in bed by 11 or 12. What he told me is that whenever he did that pattern, he found that during the week he was more productive than ever. He found that he was able to keep Christ central in his life in a greater way. He was able to stay focused on the priorities when he established this pattern of weekly having time set aside for God to remember and to rest and to refocus. Now, listen, I'm avoiding giving you a specific list of things to do or things you can't do intentionally. I think that's a misplaced question or even a legalistic pattern that developed and so that Jesus ultimately responded to saying the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And then Jesus declared himself to be the object of this day's attention when he said, the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. I'm avoiding Paul's warning to not pass judgment on specific practices relating to Sabbath. But I'm trying to lay out a pattern for you and ask that when you think about these principles, when you lay your head on your pillow on Sunday night, ask these questions. Have I remembered Who's most important and honored God in this holy time dedicated to him? Have I rested so I'm more ready to go back to work than before Sabbath began? And have I refocused my life so that I can see God's perspective more naturally and his hands more clearly? Have I remembered what's most important and honored God? Have I rested so I'm more ready to go back to work? And have I refocused my life so that I see God's perspective more naturally? This cadence of daily and weekly continues. And I just would ask you, what could you do, even this weekend, before finals, to just take one step in that direction? One step to start implementing this pattern that will take time and practice to build. But in these last few minutes, I need to complete the big picture and say, we've heard about the daily and the weekly rhythm, but there is one more aspect of this, and this is the annual calendar. And that is, as you look over the course of life, we mentioned earlier this pattern from getting started to midterms to the breaks in the fall to the rush to finals to Christmas break to the summers. There's a pulsating rhythm through the semester and a pulsating rhythm through the year that repeats, hopefully for you, four times over your thousand day experience. Um, those key moments can become the priority of our focus. Those goals we shoot for, the way we build, 
Life then can revolve around those schedules with emotions rising and falling with each assignment that's completed and every grade we get back, the hellos and the goodbyes with friends. Our identity becomes connected with it. It is interesting that in the Old Testament, Sabbath was used as a reference to the Day of Atonement and also to the seventh year of rest. When you look at their calendar, there were these periods of time where work got set aside and God was brought back into the center in significant ways with extended time to honor God together. And listen, this is not just one major. It's not exclusive to you. Uh, when I was here, I was a math major uh, with secondary ed teacher certification. Um, I've had kids now go through the youth ministry program, a mechanical engineering major, a music major, a nursing major, and a communication arts major. And the same battle is there for all of them, right? This battle that it tugs at us to make this schedule, our work, center instead of God. But it's not just about school, right? It can be sports. Go pack. <clears throat> the athletes all know this annual rhythm, right? The training, the practice, then the games, the events, the matches, the season-ending letdown, whether that's in victory or in defeat, gearing up for the next event, gearing up for the next season, the challenge of the last season. But even as spectators, I see schedules built around big games, the Super Bowls, the March Madness, the World Cups, the buildup with the anticipation and all the hype, the celebration, the processing, and then looking forward to the next cycle. It could be your hobbies. Building schedules around what you do that's most important, and I love my time in the woods hunting, but that could be hiking or skiing or photography or the new Broadway series that comes out. There's a rhythm to all of those, and all those things call for us to give time and money buying equipment or tickets, and they call for us. Those things, again, can be good. The danger is building our lives around them so they become our God. Listen, it's not just those types of things. It can be family as well. And we know the importance of relationships. Um, listen, I'm 33 years into marriage. I'm 29 years into parenting. I'm now, thankfully, three years into grandparenting. It is so cool. You know, the cycle, the, the stage of dating, wondering if you're going to get married, of marriage, of children, of the school years, of college decisions, of the kids' marriage, of graduate school choices, of empty nest, of grandkids. In the middle of all that, there was a rhythm built around soccer games. Three kids, three different soccer teams, me coaching one of them. Around the concerts, three kids all doing jazz and concert and marching band, two of them drum majors. Around the soccer matches, around the basketball games, around the plays, life gets built around that. Those can be good. And I will say, uh, being married to Amy and parenting my kids has been the greatest joy of my life. It's the greatest honor and gift and opportunity God's ever given me. But there's danger in them as well. And these Sabbath principles are still at play to ask, how do you keep yourself? How do I, as a parent, keep my family focused on God? And let me just say that for us as a family, this included recognizing that pace and the pulse and asking what do we need to do to keep us focused and help us grow. So the mission trip when our entire family went to Ecuador to serve, or my wife and I going with my son to Kenya to serve, significant vacations, extended time with family, the years we did family camps that left a spiritual focus, or times at home relaxing, were all intentionally built in to say how do we keep this Sabbath principle at play? And it leads me to ask for you, what does this look like now? As we're here at December 6th, listen, you've got to begin to think about breaks more intentionally than just, I can go home and crash for three days and I'm probably going to be sick because I'm so exhausted and then get up and run with friends and try to catch up and then keep going. We've thought, and again, you start thinking breaks, and one of the, the benefits of the academic calendar is the freedom that Amy and I have in the summers. Two summers ago, after our son got married in Rhode Island and we dropped our daughter off in Cape Cod, we took a two-week road trip from Maine across New Hampshire, Vermont, New York, all back roads with our Miata, with the top down, day by day, figuring out where we're going to stop as we went. But it wasn't just, okay, we're away. It's time to refocus and talk and relax. This past summer, I had the privilege to teach for a seminary in Asia, a two-week seminar in Bangkok and then two weeks in Singapore. Ministry was focused, but it wasn't just that. It was a Sabbath for us to not have to do the daily routine of prepping meals and cleaning the house, but to focus on God, to see his work in other parts of the world, to energize us to come back and keep him central. And listen, the danger is, I, I talk to the Bible and the Gospel students or spiritual formation students as I work with them and we're practicing disciplines over time. Every time we come back from a break, 
I talk to them and say, how'd it go? And every time they say it was worse. They tell me going into it, I thought it would be better because I had more time and I had more freedom and of course I'd spend more time with God and this would be energizing. And what they found were those voices pulled them away and they never got to those things. So I ask you, as you look ahead to get through finals and finish well, but then look at Christmas break. What could you do this Christmas break to follow this pattern and remember and rest and refocus? Does it mean time where you plan intentionally to shut off the electronics and the media and actually get some sleep? Do you have the friends at home or family members that you know are struggling with their faith or don't know Christ, and you need to intentionally plan time to get with them? Do you just need time with God, some solitude, time in scripture, an extended reading of scripture, time in prayer? Is there a book you've been wanting to read that sets to the side because you just couldn't muster the time? Do you need to reconnect with church or family? Does this allow you some time to serve that you wouldn't have otherwise? Is there a chapel message you heard this semester that just so challenged you that would be really good for you to go back and listen to again? What would it look like for you this break to remember and rest and refocus so you come back in the new year energized and focused on God to then continue this rhythm of daily and weekly and annually of keeping God at the center? To find the great joy he's given us in the stuff of life in work and relationships and hobbies, but in the midst of that to constantly recognize that he is to be center and he built this cadence into life to help us keep him focused. God has composed a rhythm for life which will help us keep him at the center where he belongs and guard us from the danger of turning other things that are good into our God. And it has a rhythm that goes daily of work and rest, of weekly of work and rest, of annually of keeping these main breaks where they focus us on God, but the focus for each of them is to remember the holiness of God and the holy time he deserves to rest and to refocus. I know the danger right now because you feel this already. We're nearing the end of chapel and so your mind is already shifting into gear to go there. And so what I'm doing is I'm gonna start the clock and I'm leaving two minutes of silence where I'm asking you to just pause and ask yourself what's one thing from this chapel that you need to think about more or wrestle with or work on. This is two minutes of silence for each of us to just have time before God and respond to this and then I will close in prayer. Eternal God, the creator of time, you separated the light from the darkness, reminding us daily of our humanity and prompting us towards the rest that we need. You have created the Sabbath for us, holy time to remember you and refocus us on you as the only true God, the one who alone deserves the central place in our lives. You set the sun and the moon and the stars in place to mark the seasons of life for us, Reminders of your faithful presence as we move forward through life. Thank you. Remind us. Guard us. Challenge us. Let the effect be the joy and the fulfillment you designed for us as we work and play and rest in your honor. For all of us, help us to finish the semester well. And then let us experience a genuine Sabbath as we celebrate Christmas, the great gift of your son, and the start of yet another year. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. Amen.